We welcome all of you to our service, especially those of you who are inquiring, searching, or exploring for meaning of a spiritual nature. Many of us, including myself, were once seeking intellectual stimulation and a place to feel connected, and perhaps seeking something outside of the ordinary to lend additional meaning to our daily lives. I found that here, and I know many of you have too. Our sermons, our groups, and our activities link us together and create a special bond. Here at Tapestry, we encourage purpose and discernment in our worship services and in our other activities. And of course, some fun thrown in there too. We strive not for perfection, but for authenticity, connection, and a recognition of our commonality. Whether you've been coming for a short time or a long time, we hope that you'll find depth and meaning that will make you think, perhaps make you question, and engage in discussion. Here you will find people to befriend you and progressive religion, religious values that will challenge you to live meaningfully, strive for justice, support the marginalized, reach out to the lonely, and to serve others here in Orange County and beyond. Our theme for the month of April is climate justice. And today, in particular, we will hear Reverend Kent speak about the history of environmentalism. We are reflecting today on the long tradition of which we are a part. In preparing for today's service, I thought back about my own early experience with environmentalism and it began in my childhood, although I didn't know that word then. One of my assigned chores in the summer in the Antelope Valley where it was intensely hot, I was to help water the many trees my mother had planted. I moved the garden hose from tree to tree and positioned it in the wide circular space that she had dug around each tree so the feeder roots would get plenty of water with the water running very slowly as a small stream, best for soaking into the alkaline hard pack. I never understood it then, but I'm convinced that on some deep subliminal level, my mother sensed a oneness with the natural environment that we, you use, now call the interconnected web of all existence. I base this on the fact that a few years later, she became familiar with the writings of Father Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a French Jesuit priest, philosopher, paleontologist, theologian, and mystic. He lived from 1881 to 1955. After reading several of his books, my mother changed the way she looked at the world. Teilhard believed that biology, the cosmos, Physiological evolution and our human spiritual development are all governed by the same universal laws and do not exist in separate silos or separate realms. Reading Tyhart is not easy. I was an older teen by the time I became aware that my mother had not finished high school and she didn't read well. So this was a big undertaking for her to read philosophically and theologically weighty material translated from the French, look up many words in the dictionary, and then reread many passages. As a result, my mother adopted a much more progressive and inclusive view of both human and botanical life and the universe. Her inquisitive and curious mind may have rubbed off on me. And in that same curious vein, I look forward to the environmental historical information that Reverend Kent will share with us. I think we're all pretty aware that an environmental crisis is facing our planet. Reports vary about just how bad it is, but we're certain that it's not good. Most of us have made choices about our lifestyle and reducing our carbon footprint a little bit. And environmental issues are in our political awareness. We know a lot about the problem, and we each live out some of the solutions every day. 
but we're not as aware, or at least I wasn't as aware, of the environmental movement that led up to this point. Yes, there's a new urgency of environmentalism today, but this movement has been around for a really long time. Today I want to celebrate some of that history and point out some of the insights from our predecessors that we might want to hold on to. This comes to surface today because yesterday was Earth Day. The idea for Earth Day began in 1969 when Gaylord Nelson, who was a senator from Wisconsin, was moved by an oil spill that occurred off the coast of Santa Barbara. Some of you, as California residents, may remember that. Nelson realized that if he could infuse the political energy of that year, 1969, with the growing awareness of environmental concerns, that he might be able to push environmentalism onto the national political agenda. So he announced to the media that there would be a teach-in across the country, and he very wisely persuaded Pete McCloskey, a conservative-minded Republican congressman, to co-chair this campaign. He also recruited other leaders, and they rapidly got a staff of 85 people to promote Earth Day events across the country. The plan worked. On April 22, 1970, 20 million people participated in rallies across the United States. The movement brought together some unlikely partners that hadn't worked together before. There were Republicans and Democrats involved. They enlisted rich and poor folks, rural and urban residents, business owners and labor leaders. That, to me, is probably the biggest lesson from this whole Earth Day success, is that slow and deliberate planning across differing interests pays off in the long run. That same year, in 1970, that growing awareness gave rise to the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. Pretty powerful stuff. There's been an ebb and flow of Earth Day over the decades. There was another big push in 1990. They wanted to make it global and not so focused on the United States. A lot of people believe that that 1990 push laid the groundwork for the 1992 United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And now they have an even grander vision preparing for 2020. The dream for then is to launch an education campaign for every student to graduate from high school around the world to be environmentally literate citizens, is what they're calling it. They want every young person to know basic information and be prepared to create change in their world. I had no idea that this Earth Day had had such an impact over the years. It goes to show that making big plans requires a lot of planning and big effort. When we know, and I preach about this all the time, that all of our small efforts make a difference and they pile up. But these victories teach us that while we're attending to those small issues of the moment, the ones right in front of us, it's also wise to set some big, audacious plans for the future. If we don't make big plans and strategize around them, then we never set the agenda. But this Earth Day phenomenon is fairly recent. It's difficult to track exactly when environmentalism started. A lot of people have different ideas, but a lot of them say that it traces back to the Arab agricultural revolution in the 800s. Who knew? During this time of great advancement, Arabic medical writing started realizing that the environment around people impacts their health. They started studying the way 
air pollution and soil contamination and solid waste mishandling affected people's health. And they started studying the impacts of where people lived in particular locations. Who knew it began half a world away 1,200 years ago? The concerns didn't hit Europe until 1272. After air pollution became a major health concern, King Edward I of England banned burning coal in the city of London. It didn't work out so well. His rule did not stick. If you're familiar with London's history, you know that it's had a really tragic history with smog from coal pollution. In 1952, it caused around 8,000 deaths from this smog that hit that year. At least that ended in the Clean Air Act for England in 1956. But imagine if Edward's rule had stuck the lives that could have been saved. America's environmentalism looks very different, at least the history of it, because we didn't have those intense urban populations. In America, the earliest obvious traces go back to William Penn as the colonial governor of Pennsylvania. He was a Quaker and a real estate investor and obviously an advocate for religious freedom. So in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 1690, he required the settlers of Pennsylvania to preserve one acre of forest for every five acres that they cut down. And he did this out of his religious beliefs, out of his gratitude. He wrote, I would not abuse God's love, nor act unworthy of God's providence and so defile what came to me clean. He was also, as part of that respect, particularly fair-minded with the Native Americans that were living in that land. And even after purchase agreements were laid out, he ensured in each of those agreements that they had rights to travel across their lands to get where they needed to go. Of course, William Penn wasn't the only one with religious motivations. John Muir, we know as an environmentalist, but he also had deeply Christian foundations. I didn't know this. This was fascinating. Read, raised by Presbyterian parents, he read the Bible every day as a young person and eventually memorized three quarters of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament. That's a lot of Bible. <laughs> he didn't stick with the Bible, though. His beliefs evolved dramatically over time. He eventually found that the primary source for his understanding of the holy was what he called the book of nature. He believed that studying the plants and animals in an environment uncorrupted by human civilization was the truest way to understand God. And that sounds perfectly logical to 21st century Unitarian Universalists, but it was way radical for the time. Of course, Muir isn't really known as a theologian, but more as a naturalist. Perhaps I should say the naturalist. His passion courage and intellect shaped the American environmental movement. His writings had been read all over the world. His activism helped preserve Yosemite Valley, Sequoia National Park, and many other wilderness areas. And maybe most famously, he founded the Sierra Club in 1892. So I couldn't talk about the history of environmentalism without talking about some of our Unitarian Universalist influences. The person that comes to the top of that list is probably Henry David Thoreau. To me, Thoreau's most important idea was his awareness of the relationship of systemic exploitations. Most of the people of his time were welcoming the Industrial Revolution. The new technology made things cheaper and faster and easier for those who could afford them. But Thoreau realized that 
new technology was mostly a tool for exploiting workers and the environment. The huge cloth mills of New England weren't running to benefit humankind with reasonable clothing. They were running to make money for the wealthy owners. The same factories that choked the air and created unending noise also chewed up labor as another expendable commodity. If people know anything at all about Thoreau, it's that he went out to Walden Pond for an experiment. When he did that, when he removed himself from society, it was out of a deep concern for the working class and the natural world. He saw the exploitation of the earth and the exploitation of workers were inextricably linked. So he conducted this personal experiment to see what it would be like to live apart from that system of cheap labor and exploitation, to live by the work of his own body and the insights of his own mind. It was a beautiful, powerful experiment that we're still learning from today. His life in the mid-1800s was so far from our internet and video games. I wonder sometimes what he would say, or probably even more, what he would choose to do to live his life in our 21st century world. Now the second Unitarian that I want to mention, and the last, is Thomas Starr King. We know him because we're from California. His career, though, began in Boston, where he was a Unitarian minister for 10 years. Eventually, he was called to serve the first Unitarian Church of San Francisco in 1860. That very same year, Thomas Starr King visited the Yosemite Valley, and he was so inspired by the beauty of the place that he preached a whole sermon series on Yosemite. But that wasn't enough. So he also started writing letters back east to be published in the Boston Evening Transcript to describe this incredible beauty. It's so interesting to me that now that people on the East Coast hadn't even seen the West and couldn't imagine the beauty out here. Along with a few artists, explorers, and politicians, and John Muir, King pushed to have Yosemite set aside as a nature reserve for the state of California. It was long before national parks ever existed. Thomas Starr King is more prominently known for saving California for the Union during the Civil War and raising funds to help the predecessor to the American Red Cross. But he was also a great naturalist. By far the most interesting thing to me in researching these folks this week was the link that they had between preservation of the environment and caring for human dignity. Those people who have been most central in preserving the environment have also been deeply engaged in preserving the dignity of human beings. They committed their lives to a pretty broad picture of mutual thriving on our little planet. This this sermon is a bit of an unusual one for me. It's more of a history lesson than a sermon. As I scratched the surface in research this week, I was enthralled with what I found, and I wanted to share some of that with you for a few different reasons. One is that the history, I find, reflects our core value of interdependence. We know that our actions affect a broad network and we depend on others to sustain our lives. The interdependence we don't often reflect on, though, stretches not just across space, but also through time. Our lives are predicated on the actions of the many generations that came before us. And just as we've inherited a robust environmental movement 
hopefully we're preparing to pass it down to the next generation. I know some of that happened Saturday as we took kids to the march. Also, I wanted to tell you this history to remind us in the midst of struggle that we're a part of a long and great tradition. If we humans are going to survive on this little planet, we each have to do our part, but we don't have to do our part alone. At times, the forecast for global warming and species extinction feels overwhelming. It's important, though, in the midst of those painful realities to remember that we have made great victories in the past. Good people, really amazing people, have built a strong, theologically grounded movement to save our Earth. It's important history. And it may just be the history of how we save our lives on this fragile little planet. Amen.